In all science, there's random variation in data. This is also true with DNA STR experiments. In this talk, we'll take a look at the stochastic effects of how different parts of the PCR experiment affect the interpretation of the data. Next slide. The polymerase chain reaction is a random process. At every cycle in the PCR, we have a number of DNA fragments. And at that cycle, th the strand will either copy and translate from one strand into two strands, or it will not copy. This happens with some probability p that changes uh, during the course of the PCR uh, based on the available reagents and relative concentrations, and does not copy with a probability of 1 minus p. The point is, is that PCR is not 100% efficient. It's not entirely exactly reproducible. It's a random branching process. A strand will copy with probability p, and it won't copy with a probability 1 minus p. And this randomness is the heart of stochastic effects in STR data. Next slide. An STR peak is a random variable. Here we have two different amplifications done by computer simulation with the same probability of copy success of 80% starting with six template molecules. After 12 rounds of copying with almost exponential amplification, we see that one amplification produces, on the left, about 1,300 copies, while another amplification, under the identical reaction conditions, produces more than twice that, 2,900 copies. Next slide. This tells us that an STR peak height measurement reflects an underlying probability distribution. You can't expect to get the exact same answer under the same experimental conditions every time. By computer simulation, uh, this was run several thousand times, we can sample from this probability distribution and reconstruct what the number of copies, which would translate into the height of a measured peak, would be, and we see a probability distribution. Here, it has a mean value of about 2,000 and a standard deviation of 280. That's a fairly broad uh, probability distribution. If you see, there's some appreciable probability mass over the entire right half of the graph, indicating a two-fold potential variation, as we see, from 1,500 copies up to 3,000 copies. That is, the observed peak height in the end exhibits a range of variation from a minimum peak to a maximum that's twice the height of that minimum. Next slide. One way to measure the peak certainty on a relative scale is with a coefficient of variation. This takes what we see visually in the histogram and translates it into a number. That number, the CV, or coefficient of variation, is the standard deviation indicated here as in a red bar divided by the center, the mean value, shown in orange as an orange arrow. That ratio gives us the visual sense and mathematically gives a computer a statistical sense of how much variation there can be as peaks range uh, from their minimum to their maximum value under the same conditions. Here, we see a mean value in orange of about 85, say RFU, with a standard deviation of 12. The full extent of the peak variation is about four standard deviations, two to the left and two to the right. The coefficient var of variation, which here is 12 over 85, the standard deviation divided by the mean, is 14%. Multiplying by 4 to get the complete range of variation, we see that the peak's probability distribution occupies half of the range from 0 
up to the maximum peak height. Next slide. A basic rule of statistics, or of chemistry, or any sort of mass action, is that when you make measurements, if you have four times the measurements, you get twice the certainty. The same is true with STR peaks. Four times the peak height will give you a probability distribution yielding twice the peak certainty. Here, we see that we have quadrupled the mean, shown in orange, up to about 350 RFU. And with this statistical sim computer simulation, we see that the standard deviation has doubled up to 25. Well, computing the coefficient of variation, if the standard deviation has doubled, but the mean value has quadrupled, then the CV, the coefficient of variation, has halved from 14% down to 7%. And visually, you can see that whereas before, the probability mass occupied fully half of the range from zero up to the maximum possible peak height, now it's only occupying a quarter of that range. Three quarters from zero up to the minimum is all white space with no probability mass there at all. This indicates the greater certainty, the greater concentration of probability around one particular mean peak value. Next slide. Clearly then, peaks are probabilities. They're sampling from a probability distribution, and the peak height itself is giving you an indication of what that probability distribution is. Here, we've rotated the scale 90 degrees, so RFU is on the left, uh, 50, 100, 150, 200, and so on. And on the right, we're beginning to look at the different sizes of STR peaks. Let's focus on the tallest peak up at 200 RFU, indicated by the blue arrow, with a height of 200. To the right of it is a sideways bell curve indicating the probability distribution and the banding pattern that goes from light gray to dark gray to light gray again is just a visualization of that probability distribution. The white line in the center of it is showing us the mean of the probability distribution pointed to by the blue arrow and the bounding blue box around it is giving us a sense of what the variation of that peak is. Notice that this peak at 200 is tightly concentrated around 200 with very little white space underneath it. Below an RFU of 150, there's really no probability that that peak would be there. On the other hand, moving to the right and looking at the red arrow, it's pointing to a peak whose center height is a mean of 50 RFU. This peak has a variation that on an absolute scale looks smaller, but on a relative scale is much larger. The space that this probability distribution takes up for the peak from the maximum to the minimum is half of the space from the maximum down to zero. See at the bottom it's white, which is zero probability that you won't find a peak there, and the upper half, where the red arrow is pointing to, the mass of probability is taking up half of that range. So the smaller peak has a much larger stochastic effect, a much larger coefficient of variation, as measured by the ratio of standard deviation to mean peak height. Next slide. Putting all the peaks together, we see that STR data is a random variable. Every one of the peaks that we observe has a probability distribution around it. Even the ones down at zero have a probability distribution. I've indicated the ones above zero with bell curves next to them. So at each different STR size and at each different RFU height, there is a probability distribution band that indicates where the PCR mass might actually be. It's not a particular one value, it's a broad probability distribution. Each peak has its own independent probability distribution. Therefore, we can construct a joint likelihood or probability function by multiplying the probabilities at each separate peak event. Next slide. 
This becomes important when we compare genotype patterns shown in color here against the observed peak data, again shown in monochrome and shades of gray. When these colored predicted patterns accurately predict where the data are, then they will align. For example, you see that the orange bar representing a homozygote allele pair from one contributor is in the vicinity of that 200 peak, then there's a high likelihood that that amount of allele can explain the observed peak data. Similarly, for the uh, two smaller heterozygote alleles shown in blue. When they're in the area, they explain. When they're outside of the area, they don't. These likelihood comparisons form the basis of probabilistic genotyping. Next slide. In addition to determining where events are based on data, statistical computing can also determine the certainty of where these events might be. In other words, the computer can calculate stochastic effects. Computers can solve for genotype probabilities, as we just saw, or mixture weights and other random variables. But peak variation is just another parameter. It's just another random variable. So by modeling the peak variation, computers can calculate the DNA stochastic effects. In fact, it can be done, and it is done uh, by modern computing, customized to every peak at every locus that appears in the data. Next slide. In contrast to this exquisite modeling of the different variation at each peak, higher variation at taller peaks, smaller variation at lower peaks, a smaller coefficient of variation with greater relative certainty at taller peaks, and so on, some analysts will apply a threshold. Now the threshold, of course, gets rid of not just the quantitative data, but all of the variation information as well. What it gives instead is a list of included alleles, shown here after the threshold in black at 50 is applied as four vertical bars. Over this all or none threshold, peaks are treated as allele events, while any signal that might appear under the threshold, those alleles are considered to not exist. It's as if those peaks were never there. Next slide. But since peaks really reflect probability distributions, the instant you draw an absolute all or none line in the sand, like a threshold, it introduces error. That error was not there before you drew the line. Let's take a look at the tallest peak probability distribution here, centered at around 200 RFU. If we were to observe a peak from this probability distribution at 199, we'd say it didn't exist. The allele wasn't there. If we were to see it just over at 201, we'd say it did exist. Now, based on the fact that that threshold is bisecting that probability distribution exactly in half, we've now introduced a 50% chance of error f as we fall on either side of the threshold. Either it's going to land over or it's going to land under, and we have some chance of a false negative or a false positive that never would have happened before. But if you look at the real peak events and their probability distributions that we see at 75 RFU and at 50 RFU that are indicated here, all of these would become false negatives with a 200 threshold. In fact, with a threshold of 150 or even 100 RFU, they would almost certainly remain as false negatives, real data that's highly informative that's being discarded by the application of a threshold. Indeed, even a very low threshold of 50 RFU, if you look at the peak probability distribution all the way in the right, would have a 50-50 chance of discarding real data depending on how that PCR process proceeded and whether that randomly produced peak was over or above 50 RFU. Next slide. We studied these error rates on a PowerPlex 16 mixture data set. The data was constructed from two different pairs 
of individuals as two-person mixtures at five different mixture ratios of 10 to 90, 30 to 70, 50 to 50, 70 to 30, and 90 to 10, as well as four different DNA dilutions of one nanogram, half a nanogram, a quarter of a nanogram, and an eighth of a nanogram. We took that data set and then analyzed it with three different thresholds, set at 50 RFU, 100 RFU, and 200 RFU. The results shown here are for the middle value of 100 RFU. Looking at the left, for a 50-50 balanced mixture, we see that beginning with one nanogram of DNA, there's a reasonably low false negative rate. But as we reduce the amount of DNA down to half a nanogram, quarter of a nanogram, eighth of a nanogram, the false negative rate, which we measure in alleles per locus, that are the alleles that are not seen at each locus, continues to increase. And by the time we're at a quarter of a nanogram, 250 picograms, the yellow bar at the 50-50 DNA mixture ratio is showing a false negative rate of over half an allele per locus. That's over a 50% false negative rate. Moving to a less balanced 30-70 mixture with a 100 RFU threshold, we now see that that quarter of a nanogram error rate has gone up to about one miscalled allele, one falsely excluded allele at every locus. And when we go to a more extreme imbalanced mixture, a 1090 mixture, as we see on the right, that level of a hundred percent false allele exclusion rate occurs with half a nanogram in red, 500 picograms of DNA. Here are units or alleles per locus and we're seeing a 100% false allele exclusion error rate. Methods that have such a high error rate are not that common in science because they tend to lose a lot of information. Incidentally, we also did see false positives occurring, particularly when using a 50 RFU threshold. Next slide. Now all this can be avoided by not using thresholds and carving up the probability distributions. In fact, with modern statistical computing, probability preserves identification information. There's no arbitrary cut. There's no decision classifying or misclassifying what is an allele, what isn't an allele. That sort of classification can be done, but it involves very sophisticated Bayesian reasoning that goes far beyond just looking as to whether or not some observed peak is over some RFU threshold or under some RFU threshold. But in fact, why would you want to know what the alleles are at all when you can know what the allele pair genotypes are by doing Bayesian calculations that will give you the probability distributions of genotypes? Next slide. So, in conclusion, data is really a probability distribution. The points that you observe are sampled from an underlying probability distribution, and this probability arises from the inherent randomness of the polymerase chain reaction. Now we can model stochastic effects to get a handle on what that randomness is. By doing this modeling, we can help explain phenomena like allele dropout, but even more importantly, make considered comparisons with genotype patterns and see what patterns might lie where the data do and uh, which patterns don't. The goal of all this is to preserve all of the identification information that is present in the underlying quantitative STR evidence data using established normative science and the rules of probability, computation, and mathematics. Thank you.